Hey nerds, what's up? Today I'm going to be reviewing my next two SPF BO7 reads, The Fire in the Glass by Jacqueline Benson and Cyro's Claw by Virginia McLean. See you after the jump. So let's just get right into it and start off with the Fire in the Glass by Jacqueline Benson. Now, I ended up buying this book because it was one of my very favorite covers in the entire competition, and I was so happy that I saw that it won the bronze medal in the overall cover competition because I really think it deserves it. It's just like, it pops out at you. So I was really eager to read this book, and then I found out that it was a YA historical fiction romance fantasy. So. That's a little out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> if you watched the video I did on my non-fantasy reads that I published recently, you'll know that historical fiction and fantasy are what I consider to be my two least favorite genres. So I was a little nervous going into this. Now, I will say I had complained about historical fiction in that video because I said that all of the historical fiction always tends to be in World War II, and I always wonder like if that's the reason I don't like it as much because I've just read so many of those stories now that they don't necessarily seem unique. So I will say that this one takes place in 1914 London, and so it's before World War I, not World War II. And honestly, the historical fiction nature doesn't really influence this part of the story as much. I think it will influence the next few books because there is hints that we will be entering World War I. But for now, it's more just that it takes place in our world with magic. So. It wasn't like super historical fiction-y, so like that part didn't end up being a big deal. Okay, but I've gotten ahead of myself. Let me first give you a quick rundown on what this is about. So our main character, Lily Albright, can see the future. But really, she can only see the future of these gruesome fates for all these people she loves. So she'll see people that she knows get brutally murdered, and no matter what she does or how she tries to change the future, she can't. So she's been trying to repress this power for a long time because all she sees are things that she cannot change. This curse eventually tells her that one of her closest friends is going to die a horrible death, and it looks similar to a string of murders that have been happening to other women around the city, particularly mediums around the city. Lily knows that she shouldn't try to change the future because she's tried and failed in the past, but she can't help try one more time, and in the process, she starts unraveling a huge mystery that is in her city and meets people and starts trusting people she never thought she could trust. So this book actually was a huge pleasant surprise for me. Like it was just so well written. Now I obviously didn't love the romance parts, but when have I ever? Have you ever heard me talk positively about a romance on this channel? I was like trying to think and maybe the only one I can think of is this is how you lose the time war. In that review, I was positive about the romance. I actually quite liked that book. But otherwise, I never like romance. So you, you know, I'm I'm an unreliable narrator when it comes to that. I'm an unreliable reviewer. Anyway, like I said, there's no denying this book is so well written, and I know people who love this genre are going to love this book. In fact, I actually recommended it to two of my friends. I texted them and I was like, I just read a book I know you'll love. Um, one particular friend, she had had me read The Winter Sea. I'll put that up here, I forget who it's by, and then My Lady Jane. Both kind of YA historical fiction romance. The Winter Sea is more adult actually, but historical fiction romances, it doesn't have the humorous nature as My Lady Jane, but it does give me that strong vibes. And those are two very popular books. So if that's something that you like, I think you would love this. Something I noticed is that Benson did a super good job of having a very full book. She had this main obvious mystery, this main plot point, but all of her characters also had other things going on that weren't necessarily directly related to the overall plot point, but gave our characters something to interact with, gave our characters some side plots that they needed to kind of deal with, whether internally or outwardly. And she just did a very good job of weaving these narratives together so that we didn't have a book that was just kind of shallow and one narrative. We actually had quite a few things going on that worked very well together to drive forward the story, but not have the story only be about that one main plot. I hope that makes sense. I will also say from 50% on, I was very hooked, even though it wasn't necessarily my genre. Like I wanted to know what happened. She wrote the mystery well. Like I tore through the last 50% of the book. I think I read it in like maybe one, maybe two days. Like I just sat down and couldn't put it down. So again, a test to her very good writing skill. I also like the magic system of this world. I always say that I either like magic to be super hard or super soft. And this definitely falls in that super soft section of the magic system. She doesn't try to explain it away. There are charismatics in this world and they have special powers. For Lily, it's seen the future. For other characters, it's seen the past. Someone can talk and kind of communicate with animals. 
there's all sorts of powers and they just come to people and you don't know why or how and they aren't necessarily explained. She does a good job with the soft magic system because the magic sometimes gets her characters out of troubles and sometimes it doesn't. And I think that's a very important thing to do is that your magic can't always save you when it's soft. You can't like just come up with new things. And I think she does a pretty good job of balancing that. There's only one thing that I will really complain about this book. And it was one of the climax scenes where Lily uses her power in a new way. And I'm not gonna say anything else because it would ruin the book, but it was in this climactic scene and I just thought this scene is so stupid. And I told my husband about this scene and he made the good point. He's like, that's a scene you're either gonna love or you're gonna hate. There's no in between. And I just totally agree. I feel like there are some people who are gonna read this scene and just absolutely love it or they're gonna hate it. And that's what, I, one bummer about reading like self-published is not as a lot of many people have read the book so I can't talk to anyone about it. So please, if you're interested in this genre, please read this book so you can talk to me about that scene. But other than that, it, no denying, this was a well-polished book, a well-written book. It was a full story. It had a good magic system. Yeah, it wasn't exactly my wheelhouse of what I normally read, but I enjoyed it and am super impressed. There's a lot of books that have the historical fiction kind of fantasy niche. And if that's your thing, I would highly recommend this book because I think it's just really well done. Next up is Cyrus Claw by Virginia McLean. I was like super excited to jump into this one first because I also really liked this cover and two because I think this was my first really like adult fantasy of the bunch that I have read. So since that's like what my usual jam is, I was excited to read it. Let's start off with a brief summary of what this book is about. Ko is a sea captain who lives at sea practically, but then is given the orders to do something she's never done before, which is to kidnap a scribe who has found out too much about their land's secrets and kind of needs to be shut down to make sure that those secrets don't get out. And this would maybe be okay, except that she's also been told she has to take some of the worst criminals of their land with her as expendable crew so that they can kind of just off them in the end so nobody knows of the scribe's existence. Taraku has always protected her valley with a fierceness that has given away to a deadly reputation. And now that she has a family, a wife and a three-year-old daughter, she is even fiercer in protecting that family. So when her wife, the scribe goes missing, she'll stop at nothing to get her wife back in safety. And she ends up doing this with the help of her three-year-old and a mysterious wolf spirit that ends up tying itself to her. And as these characters interact, that gives ways to other mysteries and secrets that unfold that they never knew they had. So right off the bat, if you just notice from my description, you'll probably realize that this is really great for LGBTQ plus uh, representation. There were a lot of different LGBTQ relationships and gender expressions in this novel. So I kind of wish I had gotten this done in time for June, but obviously it's time to read all year round. So if you're looking for a good self-publish that kind of hits that mark, this one is a great place to go. So some great things about this novel. First, our three primary characters are all female, like strong female character leads. You know I'm always a sucker for that, so I really like it. I also like that we had a married couple with a kid. I've talked about that a little before, like you just don't see that a ton in fiction. Usually they're kind of going off by themselves. So the fact that we had this kid and we had like a good loving relationship, that didn't have a ton of drama in it. It's something I always like to see. McCain does also a really good job of throwing us into her world without trying to explain it. There's a lot of different magical elements in her world and she just kind of lets it sit and lets you figure it out as you go. I think that's kind of fun only because actually the author of Cyro's Claw commented on my confusion video and talked about her favorite thing is when an author just throws you in to their world and lets you figure it out themselves. So I think that's cool that it reflects in her own writing is that's what she likes to read, so that's what she does. And I think she did do a good job. There was never a point where I was like, oh, this is too confusing. Like she throws you in, she lets you figure it out, but it's, it's easy to figure out, you know, it's it builds on itself as it should. So I really like that aspect of it because that's something I always like in a good world built fantasy novel. You definitely don't get all of the answers in this book, which I like. And I think she does a very good job of walking that line where her book is a complete narrative. You have satisfaction that what the book set out to do, it did, but it still had a few open threads making you want to read the next one. And I think that's a very fine line that she does very well. I have complained a little bit about some of my SPFBO reads in the past that I didn't feel like this was walked enough, like either it was too open-ended and I didn't feel like our books did what they set out to do. 
And so I think this one has that perfect amount. Now onto the couple things I didn't like. There were just some technical issues with this book that made it a little distracting while I was reading. The author uses like the break. Um, I don't even know what to explain this. You know, usually there's like a little tilde. I'll put like an example up here of what I'm talking about, but there's like a break in a narrative. And usually these are used to show that time has passed or a switch in POV without necessarily denoting a chapter break. Except in this book, it didn't do that. In this book, they were used so frequently and often had no time in between and no POV change. There was very few that actually functioned that way. And I know this sounds small, but when there's like 30 in a chapter, it just gets very distracting and was breaking up the narrative for me. She used them more to like denote when a bomb was dropped, so to speak, in a conversation, but then the conversation would pick up right where it left off. So I just was confused by that delineation that didn't really mean anything. And it just, it slowed down the pace of my reading. It kind of kept taking me out of the narrative. The other thing I wish she would have done technically is I wish we would have switched back and forth between the narratives a little more. At the back half of the book, she does, and I felt like it worked much better. In the first half of the book, we kind of spend two very big blocks with the two separate characters. And I kind of, I understand why she did it. it. Did just break up the narrative a little too much for me. I wish to keep things kind of moving and more interesting, I'd been able to jump back between those characters a little more than we did. Now, those are two very technical things, so they're not really that big of a deal. I just thought I would mention them. I think my story thing that I wish would have been a little different is that our three main characters functionally act very similar. They're all that kind of strong, powerful, fighting female character. And if you've watched my video about Brandon Sanderson's female characters, you know that I'd get tired if all strong female characters have to prescribe to this certain thing. Now on paper, these three characters are different. There's a sea captain, a scribe, and a fighter, but functionally they all fight very well. They're all put in situations where they're like, oh, I can't really fight, but then they like beat everybody. They're also all like snarky and sarcastic and hard edged. And so because they share so many personality traits, like there were times where two of the characters would be in the same room and I would literally forget which character's perspective I was reading from because they weren't very different. And I just wish that in this book they would have explored that female strength can be more than just a good warrior, which is something that I've said a lot about in the past and I think a lot of strong female characters kind of fall into that trope. And when you have three of them, it makes it even more important that they have differences. Either way, this book has a great world building, great magic system, a lot of great representation, and a ton of high-flying action scenes, which I think people will love. They were really good fight scenes in very different locations, a lot of high energy scenes. So that helps move the book along. I think people will enjoy it quite a bit. Okay, that does it for my two SPF BO7 reviews. If you missed my last two, you can check out this video right here. I only have two more books to go before I announce my semi-finalist for SPF BO7, so I'm very excited to get into that. As always, if you like this type of video and wanna support me, please like and subscribe, and also tell me which SPF BO7 books you're planning on reading. I know people are starting to pick some up as semi-finalists roll in. I will also make sure to link the website below that I use to keep track of what semi-finalists are coming in and what books have been cut. And if you wanna check out what I'm currently reading and other nerdy rants, you can check me out on Instagram at bookborn.reviews. I'll see you next time, bye.